Welcome to the Mind Solution Podcast with Sarah Maud. The Mind Solution Podcast is for leaders like you who are passionate about well-being in the workplace because you understand that a strong, resilient and happy workforce is the key to your organisation's success. The Mind Solution Podcast is here to help you So join us every week where we'll share with you powerful insights, strategies and know-how to ensure that your people and your organisation are truly thriving from the inside out. Hello and welcome and I am delighted today to be joined by Laura Thomas. Laura is a claims manager at Superscript, but more importantly to me, she's also an award winner of the Inside Out Awards in 2021 for her positive contribution to breaking down the silos around mental health. So welcome, Laura. Hi, thanks for having me today. I'm very excited to be here to share my journey and my experiences. Uh, Like you say, I've always been very honest and open uh, in terms of my mental health and my health in general. So, yeah, very excited to get talking. And I just love that. I absolutely love that because as we were talking about just before we came on live, that the more people that we can get talking about mental health, recognising it, normalising it, speaking their story, then it's it's my intention, I know it's your intention, that that can help somebody else out there that needs help. So, yeah, I'd love to hear you share a little bit more about your journey, Laura. It's, uh, it's certainly an interesting one. Um, I remember I've been in the insurance industry for my, my entire career, even in private practice, I was working uh, on insurance claims. And it, it's quite funny when I reflect back on my early days in my career, because, um, you know, I was feeling very low, very flat. And, and at that point, the doctor said, you know, I, I think you've got depression. Um, go through a course of therapy, and we'll give you some medication to kind of help you you know, to feel a bit better. And it was interesting at that point, because it was very much met with, you're just saying that for attention, eye rolls, oh dear Lord, um, what have you got to be depressed about? And I'm sure all of these things are not unusual to anybody listening to your podcast. And it and it was difficult, because at that point, you're sat there thinking to yourself, you know, because I love feeling like this, it's brilliant feeling terrible about yourself. (laughs) Of course, I'm doing it for attention, Uh, which if you know me, that statement in itself is quite funny, because I am notoriously introverted. I have a very small circle of friends, and everybody knows that being the centre of attention is pretty much my idea of hell. Um, So, um, you know, that was a good 10 years ago. And it wasn't until you know, it's something I've struggled with um, a lot of my life, but it, but it's it's a part of who I am as a person and we all learn to cope. And it wasn't until I st- started working with Aviva um, that I suddenly started hearing from senior leaders who were sharing their journeys. And all of a sudden it was actually we have this this working group where we really want people to share their experiences, not just with mental health, but with disability and well-being in general. And I'm suddenly in this environment where it's okay to talk about this, but not just that, it's actively encouraged. And leaders were being told, keep an eye on these things with your team. These are the things to look out. And they were training managers and leaders, you know, things to look out for, things that might say that somebody on your team is struggling with their mental health or at home. And I suddenly thought to myself, you know what, I want to be that kind of leader. And I remember very early on in my managerial role, saying to my team you know I've actually uh, (laughs) struggled with anxiety a lot of my life Um, but you know so if I ask you if you're feeling okay it's because I want you to know that actually there's days when I'm not feeling okay and that that's cool you know we've all been there appreciate you're all working on your own you're dealing with customers that have had traumatic fires you know they've lost their home and their belongings so I want you guys to be honest with me if you're having a bad day a flat day you know, let me know and we can talk about it if you need, you know, to take an afternoon off because you've had a really difficult morning, let me know. Um, Which my lead, my manager at the time was like, you basically committed career suicide, why would you do that? (laughs) No, I think the quote was, 
uh, why would you follow a general into battle if they saw you crying in the tent beforehand or something to that effect? Um, and I thought, great. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, but um, what was really uh, more interesting to me, I mean, I kind of convinced myself, no, this is wrong. I, I think I've done the right thing was actually the sickness rates for my team went down by 70%. Wow. during the time that I was managing the team and um, actually rather than just calling in with a cough or a cold people were being honest and saying you know what I'm having a really bad day I'm having a really great day it, today is not the one and it's like fine take a day if you need another day let me know I'll reallocate out your caseload I'll stay on top of the claims um, that are coming in just let me know if you need me uh, and suddenly I'm getting calls from people that are on my team saying you know what, I really struggle with like this imposter syndrome and I feel like I'm going to get caught out and I shouldn't be in this job. And, you know, every other week we'd be having the same, we would be having the same conversation and it would go on for 40, 50 minutes. But I was happy to give that time if it meant that actually after that call, that individual felt like I can go on with my day. Actually, I am doing a really, really good job. You know, it, it seems like such a silly thing. And kind of after that, I, I ended up chairing Avivability, co-chairing with a fantastic lady called Sue Kelly. And even though I was only with Aviva for another eight months after that, we made a massive impact in such a short period of time because we were just being vocal and open and honest and saying, you know what, this is the areas where we see staff struggling with. You know, it just really opened my eyes. And from that point on, I thought to myself, you know what, it is the right thing to be open. It is the right thing to be honest. And I just, it's just something that I've continued to do. And it, it's, it's just such an amazing feeling, even if you get, you know, in my, again, previous role, my boss said, people are actually talking about their disabilities. And I was like, uh-huh. And they're like, they've never done that before. I'm like, is that a good thing? And that he's like, it's just strange to hear people being so honest about it. And I'm like, but I've always been honest about my own. And that, again, encourages people, oh, actually, it's okay to talk like this in an open office. It's just, it's nice. It's just a wonderful, if it, if me being honest helps one person, well, not it's not just being honest, but open and not worried about what people are thinking. If that makes one other person think, actually, there is no shame. I'm, this is me, all of me. And that makes them feel more comfortable in their own skin. Then it, it it's just, it's, it's an amazing feeling really. And what, what I love about what you said is if we look at the statistics for the UK, for example, we know that one in four people at any one time are struggling in some way, shape or form. And it just seems to make, certainly to me, <laughs> really logical sense that if you've got an organisation I say 100 people, then look at the percentage of people that are potentially going to be struggling. But if we're not addressing the elephant that's already in the room, then how can we expect people to um, experience psychological safety? How can we expect people to be open? You know, these, these campaigns, it's, it's, it's good to talk, it's okay to talk, and it's like, well, it's actually not if the environment that they're in isn't conducive to that. So I, I absolutely love what you just said, Laura. And the impact, I mean, that's huge. 70% reduction. I mean, that's massive. I, I um, it was a bit of a, a bit of a joke, actually, when I came into the department, because, not in the sense that I couldn't do the role, but like it was notorious for kind of high turnover both in terms of managers and um and leaders and and I think a lot of that came down to you know London is a challenging area for insurers especially uh in the kind of property damage field um I've seen it for myself I've seen that that customers can be challenging you know it's their home it's their castle they're very emotive unfortunately it is often taken out on staff who are just doing their best to help. You know, we have our suppliers that are working as quickly as they can, going as quickly as they can. Um, 
you know, t tensions are high. And I think sometimes it's quite easy to forget that these people have to go home at the end of the day to their families. Um, you know, it can be emotionally just very, very draining. And I don't think necessarily that it, it was always something that was kind of considered. Um, actually, something that they were rolling out. Um, and again, I was helping with kind of the project management side was kind of um, like trauma support for some of the larger property claims, because we were becoming aware that these larger claims are not only stressful for, for the person dealing with it, coordinating all the repairs and everything else, but really stressful for the customer. So we were looking to kind of offer, well, I say we, like I'm still there, but they were looking to offer that, that trauma support for their customers to help them work through any kind of issues they were having with a professional, you know, like yourself, to kind of talk that through and make them feel supported. But, you know, in, in the pilots that they were running, they were finding that actually that the stress for the claims handler was thereby also reduced because the customer was a bit more calm, feeling a bit more together, was feeling a lot more kind of in control. Um, you know, and all these things have ramifications. You know, I think businesses forget, um, so especially when you're not necessarily face to face in an office, that there is a human being behind the computer at the end of the phone and just kind of asking if people are OK. I mean, that's great. That's a really wonderful thing to do, but sometimes it just needs that little bit extra. It needs to be more than just the kind of checkbox. So, and, and we are starting to see, you know, in the data, in the figures that companies that do spend time focusing on well-being, not just mental well-being, but well-being holistically, happier staff, minimal turnover, really low turnover, because people are happy. It isn't always about money. It's about actually feeling like the business you're working for actually cares and wants you to thrive and succeed and I suppose actually sees you as a human being <laughs> with feelings um so it's just it's I do find it absolutely fascinating kind of seeing the industry the insurance industry in particular change and evolve over time I think there's still a lot to do but I can certainly see the intention is there and they're making some fantastic strides but it's interesting what you say in terms of the financials and that it's not about money because as you pointed to, Laura, that if you've got a workforce that feel valued, that people actually do care about them, that they're seen as a human being, that they want to stay, mm -hmm. and that you're reducing levels of absence, that people, if they feel good, they're going to experience a different kind of behaviour at work, output. So if we look at well-being and all the ways that we can measure that return on investment it absolutely has a business case for it if it's measured I do see mm -hmm. organizations that do this stuff and they don't measure it and I just want to bang my head against a brick wall when I see that but there is a genuine business case to be had isn't there absolutely you know and Superscript is a fantastic example of, of kind of how to do it right. I know that there are staff that are just public transport. It's, it's not for them. They really, really struggle. It's not for them, you know. So there's flexible working hours so that actually they can be in a position where they feel comfortable or even though officially we're a hybrid working uh, business. If for some people, actually, the thought of coming into the office is just too much, they work from home. The stress is gone. When you feel good enough to come in, you come in by all means you know they they regularly show their staff that they're appreciated and grateful and it's not just by kind of you know throwing money it's, it's lots of lots of little things I think that Superscript do fantastically well in that space for example you know after I joined the business I think the first week was do you need somebody else in your team yes brilliant two weeks later I had somebody in the office working with me you know there was no oh we need to check the financials or any of that it's do you need somebody yes brilliant here you go that was that was just to me that was <laughs> it sounds so silly when I say it out loud but oh, that was groundbreaking because the amount of times I've been in a role completely overloaded working ridiculous hours uh feeling very flustered and burnt out but trying my best as you do and all of a sudden I've got you know, my own little claims executive already. And I'm like, this is amazing. And she's amazing, I have to say. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful person. But it was just, uh, 
I couldn't believe it. Um, you know, around Mental Health Day recently, they set out these really lovely little treat boxes, with like little sweets and uh, socks and things. Like when somebody has a baby, something's delivered to say, you know, congratulations, this big hamper full of goodies. You know, it's like, it's little things and they don't make a big song and dance about it, about, oh, we've sent all our staff this and we've done this for our staff. They just do it because it's the right thing to do. And I think that's a really big part of the culture that I love is that a lot of what we do as a business we do because it's the right thing to do not because we want to make a big song and dance about it and take loads of pictures and say oh look at how amazing we are for our staff like the staff will do that for you <laughs> <laughs> um you know it, it's just lots of little things as a business and I have to say you know with my, I've been very open about my mental health I've been very open about my uh, endometriosis lots of people know and will often say are you how you know how are you feeling today and I'm like yeah not bad you know or you know what have you got coming up like people are genuinely interested to hear how you're doing or when's your next surgery you know like you wouldn't normally talk about these kind of things it's all very very hush hush so when I got my referral through I was got I got my referral through and about three or four different ladies in the office like oh my god that's amazing you know like they're excited for you whereas in a business previously if I'd have been like oh I finally got my endo surgery they'd be like all right that's nice see you later <laughs> you know it's just a very different I feel like the business has just worked really hard to bring in those kind of people that that kind of want to lift each other up and genuinely care about each other and want to support each other if somebody's having a flat day it's like do, shall I, do you want to go for a walk or can I take you out for lunch or do you want to go somewhere and talk about it do you need five minutes on your own you know they are just so supportive as a business and I feel straight from the outset that that culture is is right they encourage those kind of conversations if you're comfortable if you're not that's also good not everybody <laughs> wants to sing and dance about what they're going through you, you know it's just a really fantastic place to work and Oh, yeah, I love it. Can you tell? <laughs> you outside your door after this, this podcast goes live. <laughs> and you recruiting and again. But picking up on what you said about other organisations where you were working really long hours, you were really burnt out. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of two coaching calls that I've had this week with individuals one um, who's gone into a brand new role and is part of a brand new leadership team and there's a potential opportunity to really look at how do we want to be as an organization um, the other one's about to start a new job on Monday and we we're kind of talking about same things around culture and what I found fascinating is that both of them had come from cultures where when you get to a certain level within the organisation, when you're considered part of the leadership team, there's what strikes me is there's almost this unwritten expectation that you work every hour, God sends, and there's a kind of level of pressure that's put on people to always be available, always be working. And we know, well, I know from, from being a therapist and a coach and a trainer for 10 years, that's not high performance working. That is not no. high performance working. Let's flog people until they've got nothing left to give and expect a good result. But I'd love to hear your perspective on where you have somebody who, to me, you sound like an incredible manager that you are willing Bless to. Bless you. <laughs> genuinely, that you're willing to be vulnerable, be open, treat people like human beings. And you've seen the, the result, the impact that that can have. But where you have these organisations, they might be saying that they do a lot of stuff. They might be going, oh, yeah, well, we've got these well-being campaigns, et cetera, et cetera. But they're not living and breathing it as role models. And particularly at that senior management level, where, as I say, there's this unwritten expectation about the hours worked. What, what's your sense around that, Laura? 
I, I do absolutely agree with kind of everything you're saying, certainly in other roles. I have felt that as, uh, you know, my previous job title was head of claims. Um, so working with people in very, very senior positions. And before that, um, again, managing a team of 12 um, before kind of helping support with other bits and pieces. And I think there, there was a and I acknowledge I, I very much I'm a firm believer in that you should lead by example. So in practice, what I wanted to do was make sure that I was switching off by a certain time every day. The reality of that, certainly uh, at Aviva, unfortunately, we're, we're dealing with the member of with members of the public. And, and to be fair, perfectly frank, if my house is burnt down as a customer, it's not my problem that you're really busy and overloaded. I need you to deal with my claim. And I get that. And I respect that absolutely 100% and I would probably think the same if it was my house um, so unfortunately it, it did mean that I was working longer hours than I, I than I would have liked certainly uh, on, on the kind of uh, property management side of things when I moved into a different role it was very different <laughs> and the work-life balance resumed um, I would say um, probably two, two, two or three out of five days I would finish on time other times I would work a wee bit later than I would have liked there was no pressure from my manager to do that though it was don't stay on too late you were very much encouraged to not stay on too late uh, and she always made a point of making sure that that we were relaxed and we weren't working at weekends um in my last role I I, I had my fingers in lots of pies <laughs> we'll put it that way um and unfortunately contracts are always in, on tight deadlines so again the, the reality is that whilst I wanted to finish work at, at half five uh I don't think I ever finished work before six half six ever um I, even over Christmas working to eight nine o'clock at night trying to get bits over the line stuff finished because it, it, it needed to be done it was business critical and it was just me on my own um again this is <laughs> It's got, I'm going to sound like a walking advert for Superscript, but this is where Superscripts <laughs> are completely different. I'm thinking I need to, I've just got a property. I need to have my, my, quote, my quotes just with gorgeous people like you. It's just, it's, um, so I have notifications on my, on my computer. They all turn off when I finish at six. Uh, well, my hours are technically till six. Uh, I finish at six. Uh, notification stop it stops pinging at me you know if I'm working too late I might get a message from my manager saying you need to log off what are you doing <laughs> why are you working um and um you know I think the one time I was thinking about doing some work at the weekend I was categorically told no absolutely not do not give up your weekend to do this it can wait until Monday very much no <laughs> not for you I would say um this week I've done one 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 night where I maybe worked until seven. Um, my hours are until six. Worked until seven, um, but I didn't feel flustered about it. I didn't feel pressured. It was just something I really did need to get to get done and get resolved. Um, so I have a fantastic work life balance now, and I absolutely encourage that for my team. I don't want my team working late. If they're working late because they've got too much on their plate, I'm not doing enough as a leader to support them. Um, you know, and again, this is where the business are great, because actually, if it gets to the point where um, someone on my team is saying, you know what, the workload is too much, there's too many claims. I can go to the business and say, this is too much. They've got a caseload of X. I've got a caseload of Y. It's too much for us. I'll, I'll have authority to get somebody new, you know, and that advert will be out, out the door within within the week. And this is where the business is great, because I know when I joined, one lady was saying, Oh, I'm so busy at the moment. I've had to wait like late a couple of times this week. The next time I saw her, less than a week later, adverts out interviewing people already for someone. You know, we don't mess around. And I, I feel like the leadership team here does a fantastic role of actively encouraging people to have that personal life, to switch off. If you're working while you're on holiday, it's a no, what are you doing? You have 10 minutes. <laughs> Um, you know, I, my boss asked if I'd installed like Slack an email on my personal phone. I said, no, he, he asked why, not in a kind of why. Like, it was very much, oh, why, you know, out of interest. I said, because I don't trust myself. If it goes on my phone, I'll look at it. And I don't want to put myself in that position. And that answer was very much respected. Yeah, that's fine. Completely understand. There was no pushing. There was no pressure. And, and again, 
these are teeny tiny little things that might seem really insignificant, but they make a huge difference to me. I mean, this is the first time ever, I think, in my career where I'm really happy to go to work. I love what I do. I could feel so much energy. And because working late isn't like a regular thing for me now, I'm happy to do it, you know, because I feel respected and appreciated and and all those wonderful things that you, that you should feel. But they're all very, very little things, like I say. So people actually can take that time to just relax and enjoy time with their families. I mean, it's so wonderful. It's such a little thing. But uh, yeah, it yeah. just seems very silly why so more businesses aren't doing the same thing. Oh, and I totally agree with you, Laura. I totally agree with you. And for me, you hit the nail on the head when you use the word energy. And one of the things that I'm deeply passionate about is helping organisational leaders to make the scientific leap in their mind about well, what does create a high performance working culture. And within that, I, I include well-being. But the fact is that if people are consistently working late, they are, you know, working six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14, 16, whatever hours straight, they are not in a high performance state because the body will go into exhaustion and that will go into fight and flight. So they're literally living from that place of the stress response, which is the body's survival response. And so if we think about what does, what does somebody need to be at their best? Well, they need access to the executive functions of their brain. They need to be access, able to access their creativity. They need to be able mm -hmm. to access their prefrontal cortex, which is the thinking brain. All of that has a lobotomy when we're in the survival mode, because the only thing that we're concerned with is, is my life in danger? There's a threat to life. Now, the body doesn't know that an absolutely overwhelming caseload is not a threat to life in the same way that if you're in a house and it's burning down is a threat <laughs> to life. But the mind doesn't know the difference between what's imagination and what is reality. So we know from the statistics, we've got about 70% of people, probably more if you live in London, 70% of people that are living their life from the stress response, the vast majority have just become so attuned to living in that stress response that it's become the norm instead of the exception. So they've just become so accustomed to aches and pains in their body, tension in the jaw, migraines. And it, to me, it's just such a no brainer that if you want a high performance work culture that's capable of getting the job done, getting the work out the door, of course, with the right amount of resource, then why would we be working everybody into the ground? Do you know what I mean? I, 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 you can probably tell I get so passionate about this because it's just not logical sense if you understand the mind and body. No, and I, I you know, I appreciate cost of living has gone up cost of running a business has probably gone up and I feel that sometimes some businesses do feel that they've got to spend a lot of money to make the changes necessary to kind of help support their staff you know if your staff are overloaded and, and you need more more manpower um, then absolutely you are going to have to spend a little bit of money but I, I again very simple things like switching off my notifications at six o'clock so I'm not constantly being pinged by people that are still working brilliant got game changer such a tiny little thing I, I remember reading last year about an office in London that had their computers on um, on desks that were hung from the ceiling and um, when it hit six o'clock the desks were literally lifted if you hadn't finished if you hadn't finished your work like that was it it was tough the desks were like lifted you could not physically do any more work after six o'clock oh that's hilarious I love that and I thought 
that's, that's genius. That's like yeah. sending out an email at five forty-five. <laughs> you have five minutes. Do, 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 do. Um, I mean, I can imagine in some roles that would not be practical but I just thought it was such a clever simple idea to make sure that your staff are switching off um it, and it is it's just silly little things like as a manager saying why are you still online go home it's a Saturday you definitely shouldn't be online I'll be addressing that in a minute you have five minutes to send an email before I revoke your access from the system I have heard somebody say that before um it's silly little things well, not even silly. They they probably seem inconsequential, but cost nothing to just make sure your staff are taking the time to switch off. I think if you know that your staff are constantly working late, you need to say something as a manager. Why? Why are you doing this? Is there something that I can help with? Is there too much on your plate? Or is it actually you take took a couple of hours out to pick your daughter up from school and actually that's why you're working a bit later you know help me to understand what I can do to, to help you because if I know that actually the reason you're working late is because you're taking that time out to spend some time with your daughter to pick her up from school and when she gets home to make sure that she's fed then I'm not going to be as worried as knowing that actually you've worked straight through from 9 30 to 8 o'clock with no real break no real lunch because that's going to be ringing alarm bells for me and it's not sustainable yeah. um I, I just think it costs nothing to sit down and communicate with your team to understand that both them as a person how they work and what they need from you in terms of support to thrive it's completely free and you can learn so much from a quick 45 minutes over a coffee not necessarily in the office down the road away from everybody tell me about you how's it going at home got any holidays planned anything exciting coming up in your diary you know show an interest and then somebody will open up and it's just it's the best feeling it's the best feeling and and seeing people thrive like you say what more could you ask for yeah I'm, I'm interested to get your views Laura because one of the things around working hours that I've seen um, working with organizations and people one-to-one is that sometimes it's not about the organization and it's not about the organization culture but that working every hour that God sends can still be seen as a badge of honor there's something around this sense of external validation that you know well this week I worked 50 hours and someone go well I've worked 65 I didn't finish till nine o'clock last night well I was still sending emails at 11 there's in some environments there's almost kind of this level of competitiveness around being seen to be working the hardest that we're rewarded for working really hard and that that sort of internally generated because we're looking for a feeling we're looking for some kind of emotional kickback because we don't do anything unless it makes sense to us so where it maybe isn't about the culture but it's actually being generated from in in the individual themselves that I know I used to be one of these people when I first um one of my earlier HR roles I work for Debenhams, God bless them, because they're dead now. <laughs> um, I work for Debenhams on Oxford Street, and I think I was about 24 at the time. And I would be at my desk for seven o'clock. And I felt a sense of pride about being at my desk for, for seven o'clock. And it was, I'm, I'm showing my age now, it was, it was <laughs> actually write down on the book what time you started. Um, oh Lord. I know, I know, it's a lot. I didn't even know that was a thing, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> look like you're a little bit younger than me. But yeah, it was maybe it's also the retail environment. You you'd literally write down in a in a login book what time you started. But I did genuinely feel this sense of pride at being able to say, I'm here. It's seven o'clock in the morning. I'm the only one in the office. Nobody's gonna be here because the rest of the team would just like trot in it like quarter to nine. And because it was a retail organisation, you know, we would work, you know, the, the shop was open. We were, I was in Oxford Street. 
Um, and I did feel this sense of pride about the amount of hours that I've worked. And now my manager would have numerous conversations with me, a wonderful manager called Neil Watson, who would often sit down and say, we need to talk about your hours. <laughs> I, I just nod, I just nod. I knew that I wasn't gonna change that because actually what I learned, and it's only when I started to study the mind and body that I realized I was getting this internally generated feeling of feeling proud. I was looking for external validation status recognition so I was creating it it was all in my head it was completely make-believe but I believe that that's how I could get those feelings from those hours worked does that make sense it, it does and it's a really um it's quite interesting because I do still see a lot of that on LinkedIn I worked x amount of hours but what I find really interesting is the comments because some people will be like oh yeah I feel you um, but then a lot of people have started to say, but why are you proud for working those hours? Like, what have you had to sacrifice? Like, was it worth it? Uh, it kind of questioning. And, and, it, it, and it's interesting because I certainly um, in my Aviva days, when somebody would make that kind of statement, the, rebut the rebuttal, I suppose, from, from the leadership team would always be, we're more concerned about why you're having to work those kind of hours um, to kind of try and identify the root cause. And, and you know, and again, at, at Superscript, I would say that kind of mentality isn't encouraged. I know that um, our CEO has been putting in very, very long hours, bless him, uh, lately. Uh, we've just kind of about to close our Series B. Um, and that's required a lot of hours, you know, that a lot of work goes into these prep, prep presentations, all the bits and pieces that you need to get together for investors. But I also know that that's not something that he would normally advocate doing in normal circumstances on the day to day. And I think everybody, you know, on our board would be very concerned if people were putting in regularly putting in those kind of hours. I think on a, on a rare occasion, absolutely, these things do happen. You know, we're in insurance and sometimes big deals are going to be brokered and that involves a lot of money and a lot of hours to get over the line especially if you've got clients on the other side of the world um, but I think on a day-to-day -day, I, I would say that I am seeing a bit of a shift in insurance in that if those kind of hours are becoming a regular thing that that more and more managers are actually taking the time out to say what's going on <laughs> and they and I think they do genuinely just want to be assured that actually this isn't this isn't normal actually something's uh like I say there's a big deal going on trying to get something over the line and actually there's a wee bit of work like as long as people can be reassured that I suppose if you're doing 50 60 hours a week every week like you say it's not sustainable but I am again I am noticing a shift it's slow but I am definitely noticing a shift and I would say that a lot of what I'm noticing in our business is that 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 mentality is, is very few and far between I'll be honest I haven't seen it at all but that's not to say that it isn't there but I've, I've not seen any evidence of it um, as of yet we really do again as a business take a point to kind of say to people it's really really important to take your downtime and, and you know where I was before you need to take downtime you need to make sure you're taking time out spend with your family you know it's precious if people have been as taught as anything since the start of COVID uh, life is short and you've got to take your time with your family I mean geez what I wouldn't give to go and see my parents again I know it's coming <laughs> but you know um yeah you gotta just it's my husband always says and uh I'm not I'm sure I agree entirely but he's like it's just a job like nobody's gonna die um if you don't send out that email he's like it's just a job I am not going to kill myself you know arranging training for people like it's not worth it it's just a job it pays the bills and when I come home I can chill relax and forget about it and that's how it should be I don't necessarily agree with all of those statements but it's true it is just a job is it worth burning yourself out and ending up in hospital for is it I don't know <laughs> I mean I know that there are a lot of people that are deeply passionate about their job I mean running a running the company that I do it's 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 in my blood it's my baby and during lockdown particularly I mean 
I'll, I'll hold my hands up. I was working some crazy hours because we were slammed for training. <laughs> um, great for business, the pandemic, really great for business. But it was, there's, to me, there's that balance. There's a, there's a balance. There are times when we need to put our foot on the accelerator. And we're not saying that that's a bad thing, but it's like a car that if we keep our foot on the accelerator and we don't stop to top up the tank, to top up on the oil and the water, eventually it is just going to come to a standstill because as you say, the body, it's not sustainable for the body. It's not sustainable for for high performance working. And yet we're slowly starting to see those connections those dots being joined that this way of working is just a very old paradigm and the more that we can educate people raise those levels of awareness raise consciousness and really start to challenge why do we do what we do Mm. and what's a more effective way that actually it's a win-win scenario so I, I, yeah, I totally, totally agree with you, Laura. Now, one more question for you. I'm guessing, I'm willing to guess anyway, that there are going to be some managers or business leaders that maybe are listening to this podcast and they've heard you say, you know, taking 45 minutes out to talk to your team, have a coffee. I haven't got time for that. I've got a team of 20 I can't be going and spending 45 because that's I know from our (laughs) our management mental health training programs that we run that's often an obstacle is 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 time fatigue that they haven't got the time to be having those kind of conversations now you and I both know that actually the return on investment Mm -hmm. of a 40 minute conversation will end up saving you time later on down the line because you can turn somebody's perspective round or you can recognize that they need help and direct them to the right channels and things like that so we know the cost of not addressing it but I wonder what your response would be to managers that might be thinking I, just, I, I haven't got time to be having all of these lovely conversations I think um and it may sound a little harsh but I think you will always find the time to do the things that matter to you and I think if you that's not to say that managers that are very busy and feel like they can't take the time to talk to their staff don't care in any way shape or form that's not what I'm saying at all but it that is the kind of instance where I would say if taking that 45 minutes out with that individual has helped them to feel like a weight has been lifted or help them work through something that they just needed that extra space to work through then means I have to work till seven o'clock in the evening you know what that that those are the this is what I mean by I'm on on occasions I'm happy to do it 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 doesn't matter because at the end I wouldn't be sat there at the end of that day if I'd spent two hours out with somebody on my team and had to work an extra two hours to make sure I got everything done I needed to do I wouldn't be sat there huffing and puffing I would be sat there thinking it's worth it was worth it it was worth it To, to, to give up your your time to help someone else is it's it's always worth it you will always find the time to do the things that you care about it and it probably it might be difficult for managers that are feeling stretched and on that kind of precipice already but you know what you might discover something about yourself in that half an hour 40 minutes it doesn't even have to be half an hour or 40 minutes it could literally just be 20 minutes away from the office away from the computers let's grab a coffee let's go for a walk what's going on talk to me um you know, it, it, it is so, so valuable. And you know what, that person will, you probably will have made their day, especially if they haven't been able to get something off their chest. And it shows them that you care as a leader and that you value them. So the next time they do need some time, that they're going to pick up their phone, they're going to take you to one side because they know that they can talk to you. Like, honestly, it is, it will open so many doors for you. And it really doesn't require much of your, of your time. It, it Yeah. 
you will find the time you will make the time if it matters and it should matter that sounds very preachy I'm sorry (laughs) absolutely doesn't and I I love what you said um I've been very blessed when I worked I worked in HR for 12 years um I had some wonderful managers that absolutely role modeled that behavior and I know as an employee at the time the impact that that had for all the reasons that you said you felt you felt valued you felt cared for you felt like a human being you felt like somebody really understood your world I've also worked with some highly toxic leaders (laughs) did I hang around for very long absolutely not so I can Uh, totally into the return on investment And the funny thing is that if that individual, you know, lives with anxiety like like I do, they'll be like, I'm really sorry because now you're going to have to stay a bit later or, or, oh, I forgot you had to do that thing. And now you're going to my instant response to that is no, nothing for you to worry about, nothing to do with you. Like, forget about it. That's for me to worry about. Just do what you need to do, you know, and you do. Sometimes you will have to provide that assurance to staff that are struggling. Don't worry about me. This is not about me very much. I'm just uh, really pleased you've been able to talk to me. I, I'm it, like it, every single time. It means so much. It makes it's yeah. It's uh, sometimes I struggle to kind of get the words out. But but honestly, having a team that feel like they can talk to me is just the most amazing feeling for me. Not for any selfish reason, other than to know that actually I'm the leader that that I feel that I'm the leader that I needed when I was in my 20s showing my age a bit now (laughs) but I feel like if I'd had had that that leadership when when I was starting out my career you know who knows not to say that I've not done well in my career but who knows where I could have ended up you know probably a heck of a lot sooner than I did that's not to take away from any of my achievements now but I just feel in insurance in particular we need more openness and honesty it's such a tiny thing it requires very little effort I'm not telling saying that you have to disclose all of your personal history and stories but just a little thing like I live with anxiety or I have social anxiety so the idea of a last minute invitation to go for drinks mm -mm, not gonna happen (laughs) for no for no logical reason at all I know it's all meant like it's my own mental barriers but everybody that knows me both professionally and personally will know you need to give me at least two days notice so I can just you know silly little things but saying something like that makes your staff see you as human and normal (laughs) it makes a big difference such a little thing well these things aren't little are they because done consistently they they really mount up Laura thank you so much I think you're such an inspirational leader and if more leaders out there were like you whether they experience challenges with mental health or not it doesn't matter the fact that they are open that they care so thank you so much if you want to stay on for one more second but for anybody that's listening if you've got any comments then please do post them but we hope that this has given you some food for thought and until next time bye bye for now